Welcome to Insurance for Young People Transitioning from Your Parents' Insurance. This webinar will cover uh, all the information that you need for preparing to uh, select and use and manage insurance, your very own insurance, for the first time. We're very happy that Katie Verb and Miriam Goldstein from HFA could join us today to present on this topic. We have a few uh, housekeeping notes to go through. So this is the second in a series on insurance. Next January, January 18th is probably the date we'll be holding it. We'll be doing another um, and the third and final webinar in this insurance series on the other end of the insurance process, which is uh, baby boomers or bust transitioning to Medicare. So if you know anyone who's thinking about that transition, uh, please let them know that they'll want to check in with us about that. A few quick items of housekeeping. If you called in on your phone, please mute your phone uh, during the webinar so we don't pick up background noise. We'll answer questions at the end. Um, if you are uh, using your computer to join the webinar, you can submit questions via chat throughout the presentation. I'll send a quick sample chat right now. So we'll collect those throughout. Uh, and then at the end, I'll unmute everyone. And you can also ask questions via your computer audio or your phone. Slides and a recording will be available on our website at hemophiliaca.org under our Programs tab. And with that, I will hand it over to Katie and Miriam. Great, thank you very much. Um, so we are gonna be talking today um, about um, some insurance. And so my name's, uh, Robin had introduced us, my name's Katie Verb, and I am the Director of Policy and Government Relations for the Hemophilia Federation of America, and I'm here with Miriam Goldstein. Hi, I'm Miriam. I'm a Senior Policy Analyst with HFA, and I'm also a uh, a hemophilia mom with two sons in their 20s, so this is a subject near and dear to my heart. So we're gonna be covering just some basic insurance terms. Um, it's really helpful, I know, even if a lot of people have dealt with this, just to do some review, it's always helpful for us. Um, and then Miriam's gonna talk about transitioning, and then we're gonna talk a little bit after that about what to think about when you are finally choosing a plan. Um, I will just preface this by saying that insurance, um, Miriam and I work on insurance issues all the time, all over the country is uh, an area of expertise. However, that being said, there are so many things that happen and so many different types of plans and you know there are 50 different Medicaids and there's all a lot of different issues that can come up and so we might not know the answer to a question but we will do our best and um, get back to you uh, if, if we can't help right now. But all right, so basic terms, premium deductible copay coinsurance. Um, I know that these are terms that a lot of people have heard a lot, but it's always really helpful to review. Um, there was a recent study that showed, um, that was done by a, a big um, nonprofit health entity, and they found that only 4% of Americans could identify all four of these terms together. So it's always helpful to review, even if you think you know, but a premium is the, a monthly amount that you pay for your health plan. So once a month, usually, you know, between the first and the fifth, much like rent, you send in your premium and depending on what kind of plan you have, then usually in hundreds of dollars. And then the deductible is that the amount that you must pay out of pocket before your health plan kind of kicks in. Uh, so if you've got a deductible that's say $2,000, then that means that you will be responsible for $2,000 worth of out-of-pocket costs before your plan steps in and covers the rest. Um, now, this doesn't apply to all services, and we'll go over in a few slides what that does apply to, but a copay is a fixed dollar amount that you pay for services or prescription drugs. So if you see, if you're reviewing your plan, you're looking and it says, oh, you know, generic drugs have a $10 copay. So that means every time that you're prescribed a generic drug and you walk into the CVS or you walk into the Walgreens that you will be paid, you know, $10, it's a fixed dollar amount. 
Coinsurance is something that is a little bit more applicable to our community. That is a fixed percentage amount that they will often charge for specialty services or specialty drugs. So if you're reviewing a plan and you see a percentage, you see maybe 20% or 15%. That means that no matter what the cost is uh, for that, you are going to be responsible for that 15%. So a lot of um, plans have been applying coinsurance to specialty drugs and to specialty things. So that's something that we see a lot in our community. So what are the basic types of plans? Uh, these are if these are um, acronyms we hear a lot. I know that I've you know you hear these all over the place. But what does that really mean? What is an HMO, a PPO? Um, those are really the two most frequent ones. But an H, uh, HMO is called a health maintenance organization, and that is a type of plan. And these are private plans. These are plans that you will find in in the private sector. Uh, public plans are Medicare or Medicaid uh, for California, Medi-Cal is what that's called. But if you're looking at private insurance, these are the types of plans that are offered. Um, an HMO is a health maintenance organization. It is the uh, type of plan where you need to get most or all of your care from an in-network provider. So if you sign up for an HMO, generally every everyone that you see you have to go to someone who's in network and almost always you have to choose um, a PCP if you see that anywhere or that's a primary care provider and generally you have to choose a primary care provider and then you're allowed to go to a specialist and then you have to get a referral um, so if you have an HMO sometimes networks can be limited you have to have a primary care physician or a primary care provider who has to refer you for specialist care and then if you want to go outside of your of that network, you will most likely have to pay all of the costs. So for our community, that's something to think about. Um, you know, if, if you're HTC, if you go to an HTC or if you go to a private hematologist and they're not in network, if you have this type of more restrictive network plan, you would have to pay everything to go to that out of network provider. A PPO is a little bit more open. Um, they have um, they have a network of doctors and hospitals that have all agreed to charge people on this plan less money. Um, and you can generally go outside of the network at an additional cost. So in network is cost less, out of network costs a little bit more, but not at all like it would in an HMO. And then a POS is a little bit more rare, but this is a point of service plan. And this is kind of a mix between an HMO and a PPO. They, there's more choice than what's generally available with an HMO. Um, you might still need to choose uh, that PCP or that primary care physician and get referrals, but you generally can go out of network um, with, a, with a little bit of a higher cost. So it's a little bit less, rest, less restrictive. And the final type of plan is um, these HDHPs. These are called high deductible health plans. Now, these are really important because we have seen a huge uptick of these types of plans, especially in the employer market. So if you have, um, uh, in 2017, there was a survey that 35% of large employers only offered high deductible health plans. So that's something to think about um, as you're thinking about transitioning, thinking about getting your own and where you're working. These plans, um, they have, they, they might have low premiums. But that means, you know, as I said on the last slide, that deductible, that amount that you're required to pay uh, before your plan kicks in, these are that's really high on these plans. So you might, they might look really good because they used to say, oh, well, they're only $150 a month or $200 a month, but the deductible is usually in like the five or six thousand range. Um, they do have uh, a couple of different caveats to them: is that there is a different out-of-pocket maximum for them. Um, right now it's 6550 uh, 6, for individuals and 13100 for families. Um, that grows at a little slower rate than, some of the, that, than the traditional out-of-pocket maximum. Um, and then you can also use what's called a health savings account if you have one of these HDHPs. Um, and that is an account that you can put money aside pre-tax that you can use to spend mm -hmm. on, that you, you can use to spend on health needs. But you know, something to consider for our community is that that's really great for somebody who doesn't think that they're ever going to really have to spend that kind of money and also has a lot of expendable income that they can just kind of set aside two to three thousand dollars. But um, for people with bleeding disorders, we know that we're going to use, um, we're going to get through the deductible. We know that our that medicine and doctor visits and all of that are going to eat that up. So 
it's very difficult sometimes to find that extra money in the um, in the beginning of the year to set aside because you need to use it for healthcare at the beginning of the year. You might need to use it to cover your deductible, et cetera. But we are seeing more and more employers switch to this model because um, they've got low premium. So the next slide, um, I want to talk a little bit about this concept of fully insured versus self-insured. Um, this applies to, again, to private plans, not to, the, not to the public plans, but a lot of people hear this term self-insured, and what does that mean? Um, I, you know, some, one time I gave this presentation and someone said, well, I'm self-insured, I buy my own plan. But, you know, that's not, it, it means something totally different than that. But it's really important because there are some different rules for self-insured plans. And again, a lot, most of the employer plans, almost all of the employer plans that we see are self-insured. So what does that mean? Um, if a plan is self-insured, that means that the risk bearer in that health plan is the employer. So that means that if you work for a large company, that, that company has decided to set aside money and use that money to pay for um, pay claims out. So if you are an employee of this large uh, and you have to you need your medicine and you need your you know go to a doctor's fund and you file a claim or you you know send into your insurance and you're self-funded that um, the, the funds coming to pay those bills are coming directly from an account that the employer has set aside. And now, a lot of these employers might hire big companies to, to administer that. Um, you know, sometimes with these employers, they, they've got their own business to do. They don't want to be running healthcare plans on the side, so they might hire Blue Cross or hire United to be plan administrators. So, this might be really confusing because you might work for a huge company and be self-funded, but you might have a Blue Cross Blue Shield card in your wallet. But you can usually look on that card, and some of them say that, that, that they're just an administrator. And that's how you can know if you are in a self-insured plan. Um, and, but generally, if you work for a big company, almost always. Uh, or if you're a state employee, most states are self, have run self-insured plans. And this is important because Self-insured plans are exempt from covering essential health benefits. So that list of 10 things that, the, um, that are determined kind of essential quality health care in um, self-insured plans do not have to cover those 10 things. So that we haven't seen a lot of plans not offering great cover coverage because many times these self-insured plans or a health care plan is part of the benefit of being an employee there. So if a big company wants to hire good people, generally they'll offer robust care. So there's a little bit of a give and take there. While they're not required to essential health that cover health benefits, many of them do just in the um, spirit of providing good coverage for their employees and, and retaining good employees. But and, but another big trend that we're seeing in these plans that is important to think about is um, something that is called an accumulator adjuster program. And I know that sounds like a really complicated term and what the heck is that? But uh, that means that a lot of our community use what are called copay cards. And those are cards that are given from pharmaceutical companies and they're given to patients to use to buy their medicine. So when those copays like we had talked about on the other slide, when those co-pays, that co-insurance is really high, a lot of companies give out these cards and you can use that to, to buy the medicine. <clears throat> um, and so you've got, so you think, okay, this co is great and um, you know I can use this card and then I won't have to pay my deductible because that money will go to it. But a lot of these big self-insured plans are saying, no, 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 you can use your copay card, but you'll still be responsible for your deductible yourself. And so they're taking the cards to cover the, your act, getting you getting your medicine, but they're still making people pay the deductible on their own. So that's something that we're starting to see happen a lot this year, and we're expecting plans, more and more plans in 2018 to be doing that. So if you work for a large employer and you've got, um, you've got that concern, you should call your um, call them. And then that kind of brings me to my another big point about self-insured plans, that if you're having an issue with what they cover or having an issue with something like I had just said with your copay cards, you, those issues are usually resolved by the employer, not the health plan. So you would call the HR department of that large employer and tell them that you need access to something or talk to them about what the rules are because they determine those coverage rules. Now, a fully insured plan is, is 
simply having, you know, purchasing an insurance plan from an insurance company. Um, they That insurance company covers all the risks, all the costs, all of that. And so that's a little bit more self-explanatory and streamlined, but it's the self-insured plans, I think, that, that can really confuse people. So the next slide, we've talked a little bit about these out-of-pocket maximums and it's money that you're going to be required to owe and deductibles and all of that. And, and we know that the Affordable Care Act, uh, at least for now, that, that is still law. It has not changed. So for now, in the coming months, we still operate under those rules. And so the Affordable Care Act put into place these annual out-of-pocket maximums. And the idea behind that was that it's, you know, really expensive to have health care and you need to, um, you know, we need to cap some of those costs off for patients, especially patients like, like us, patients with bleeding disorders that need, that have really high costs. There needs to be some kind of cap. So annual, so out-of-pocket maximums for 2018 are going to be 7350 for individuals and then 14700 for families. And they have to include the deductibles, co-insurance, co-payments, and then qualified health expenses for essential health benefits. So your deductible, if you pay your deductible, that will count towards that $7,350. Any co-insurance that you have to pay, co-payments you have to pay. And then I had, remember I had talked earlier about those essential health benefits, those 10 things plans have to cover. If you uh, utilize any of those benefits, then any of the spending on that goes towards this out-of-pocket maximum. So generally, if you are spending inside those, inside those parameters, you'll, you'll be capped out at $7,350. What they don't include are premiums. So I know a lot of people, well, that, that two, three, four, five, six hundred dollars a month that you're spending is not going to cap out at this. You still, they don't include premiums. They also don't, inc they don't uh, include payments or billing for uh, out-of-network providers. So if you've got, a, like I had said before, a really restrictive HMO you, and you go out of network, you will be responsible for that. And then um, that's not going to count towards your out-of-pocket max or anything else that's deemed out of network by the, pan, by the plan. It also doesn't count on uh, spending on non-essential health benefits. So if you're wanting to get something um, covered that isn't included in the, essential, in the um, EHBs, the essential health benefits, and, and you want that to be covered, any spending on that will not go towards your out-of-pocket. So something just important to think about just to make sure that um, you know the treatments that you want are covered, make sure the doctors you want to see are covered because you, you'll be required to pay extra for those. So, Generally, out-of-pocket costs vary by plan, so just something to think about when you are picking plans and looking at what you're going to um, what you're going to want that um, most typical employers, HMOs, they cover about 93% of the cost, so that's a pretty good deal. Like I was saying, you know, even though they don't have to do essential health benefits, most employers want to have good quality health coverage so they can attract good quality employees. So they will usually pick up a lot. Um, what they will cover is pretty high. Platinum marketplace plans are, um, they cover about 90%. If you're a federal employee or have an FEHB, um, usually that covers about 87%. If you are, uh, if you have an employer that has, that uses a PPO, they cover about 80 to 84% depending. And then I've, done here, the um, gold, silver, and bronze cover respectively down. So um, just thinking about this in different terms, thinking about this in percentages, if I'm looking on the marketplace and I want to buy a bronze plan, you just know that, you know, yep, the premiums might be low, but if I have to do any spending, I'm going to be required to pay 40% of that. And that's a lot uh, when, you, when the costs get high. So I think this is just a good visual to kind of remember when you're out there picking plans that what you're going to be responsible for. So this next slide, what is open enrollment? I know that term gets thrown out a lot. I know that we've heard it a lot lately, especially since open enrollment for the marketplace just started. Um, open enrollment is the time period that you can enroll in new plans. So it's almost always in the fall. If you work for a large employer, check with HR for that open enrollment start date. So that's when you can kind of go in and see what plans they offer and maybe negotiate, you know, negotiate coverage and. Um, it's that time of year that you can make, um, look for plans and start making those decisions. 
If you are looking for uh, on a marketplace plan for Covered California, open enrollment is November 1st through January uh, 31st. Um, and so that's a little bit larger than what's happening around the country. California kept it open to really normal ACA enrollment options. Now, just so you know, just to be aware that if you are up buying on the marketplace and you want your plan to start January 1st, if you've got a plan now for the marketplace now that you know is going to expire mm -hmm. December 31st and you need a plan to start January 1st, you have to sign up by December 15th. And if you just sign up after that, up until January 1st, then that delays implementation of that plan by a month. I think the next plan starts February 1st. So, um, Medi-Cal open enrollment. Medi-Cal is your California um, Medicaid program, and that is 365 days a year. Um, that if there are, that's usually income based and so, or, or issue based or dis disability based. So generally once you fall into the situation of needing to be covered under Medi-Cal, then you can enroll into that. And there's a, there's a process for that. There's also um, special enrollment periods with, um, with all plans usually, but particularly for the marketplace, this, if you miss this window, but you, um, if you've been fired or you divorced or there was a death of the family policy holder or just sometimes uh, for marketplace plans, if you become pregnant, they can have their special enrollment period that you can go in and contact the plan and pro provide evidence of this kind of life change, life altering event and enroll then. So I'm going to hand it over to Miriam now to talk about transitioning. And and actually, Katie, if you stay on the slide for one more second, a special enrollment period is also triggered by your birthday if you're aging off your parents' plan. So, um, for example, I have a 25-year-old son who will turn 26 in the middle of April of next year. So that will, he, we will obviously do it before the end of April, but that triggers a special enrollment period. He could buy a marketplace plan that goes into effect for May 1 because we can cover him through the end of April. So um, one, last, one last piece of information about special enrollment periods. Before we transition to a totally different topic about transition. Um, so we should probably define the terms. Uh, transition is basically moving from childhood to the increasing responsibilities and rights of adulthood. Um, and it's a big deal for anyone, but there are obviously extra issues and extra complexity for someone who has a chronic disorder, like a bleeding disorder, um, because young people who are living with a chronic disorder and with lots of involvement with the healthcare system are going to have to be dealing with a whole range of issues that most other young people won't encounter for possibly decades or even ever. Um, so. It's a, it's a big area of concern for our healthcare providers and for our families and for the young people themselves. Um, it is absolutely not a matter of flipping a switch at age 18 or 21 or 26, but an ongoing process. So, a big picture take on transition for someone with a chronic disorder is again this idea of a process. There's um, the need to acquire sort of foundational knowledge about your own medical condition and accepting a, your role and responsibility for making appointments and ordering factor or medication, adhering to your treatment plan. Hopefully this is a gradual process that um, you're, you're working on with your family and with your HTC from really early on in adolescence um, because, because you can't just flip that switch. But um, let's hone in now a little bit into closer um, focus on how this, how transition in the insurance world um, the implications there. Um, and, and here I'm going to talk to the parents for, for just a moment and um, just say as a fellow hemophilia parent, you know a lot about insurance from your years of experience um, with your child. And yet I think even for us, it is a complicated topic. So 
we know it absolutely doesn't come naturally. And so uh, all of this is just to say there's really a great need to explain and come back and, and repeat and go over things probably numerous times. Um, because none of this is is intuitive or, or comes very naturally, um, and it, it's hard to remember to to pass along your experience and then the reasons for why you do things the way you do. Um, so here's the example on the screen: um, if your child, let's say, let's say you're working with your teenager at this point, or um, and you've been told to go see a provider for a course of physical therapy, start explaining why is it important to look for an in-network provider? What are those implications that Katie was talking about in terms of cost if you go outside of network? Um, some other examples, concrete tips that um, we've heard through the years from either other parents or from HTC staff are things like, um, when your your child uh, either gets their driver's license and suddenly they've got a lot more freedom and they're going to be off without you um, a lot more, or if they're heading off to college, that's a good time to get them their own insurance card so that they can have it in their wallet if, you know, heaven forbid something happens. Um, similarly, if they're starting to go to doctor's appointments on their own, make sure that they have a ca cash or credit card with them so they can pay the, the copay, the $35 that you know you have to pay off the bat just to get in the doctor's office. Um, maybe walk through an explanation of benefits if you get one from your insurance company for their care. Um, similarly, if you get a letter about a change in coverage, for example, um, your insurance company is moving you to a new specialty pharmacy, share that and talk about why it's important and frankly talk about why it's important to open snail mail because um, it we grew up with snail mail but our kids maybe haven't and and tend not to to view it as something that they actually have to pay attention to um, do, did you get a bill from your specialty pharmacy for a copay on factor but you know you're signed up in a manufacturer's copay program. Um, sometimes people make mistakes in billing. You don't want to pay that copay if the, the copay program is covering it for you. Again, go over that because this is this is second nature to us, but it's a foreign language to to young people and, and understandably so. So okay. Um, enough of talking to the parents. Um, how, as a young person transitioning, maybe aging out of a parent's insurance, how can you get coverage? And this is just a summary of a couple of things that we're going to talk about. There's the job-based insurance from the employer. Um, again, if you're up to age 26, hopefully you can stay on your parent's plan. There is an option of extending that coverage for a period of time via COBRA. College your university health plan, the public plans like Medi-Cal and in California also the GHPP, and then the individual market, the, the marketplace insurance that Katie was mentioning. This is an infographic that um, we at HFA put together. Um, it's a decision tree to help um, figure out what you are eligible and where to look. And I, I want to say it, it may be very hard to see on your screen in the course of this webinar um, because there's a, it's a complicated slide and there's lots in the fine print. So uh, you can find this on the HFA website and a link is provided at the end. We have a resources page. So you can come back to it, look at it at greater length, zoom in and, and make some of it bigger. Um, the, the only other thing I want to say right now about this slide is uh, at the bottom in the orange oval, you'll see sort of all lines lead to healthcare.gov, which is the federal website for marketplace plans. In California, you have colored cal coveredcalifornia.com, 
Um, so you can either go directly to the Covered California website, but if you go to healthcare.gov, it will redirect you to Covered California. So healthcare.gov is kind of a no wrong door place. You can go there. And once you put in that you're from California, it will redirect you to the right site. So let's start with job-based coverage, because that really is sort of the bedrock or default option in the American insurance system. That's sort of a historical accident, but that is where we are in 2017 and where we've been for a long time. Um, Katie talked about the issues of self-insured versus fully insured plans. And um, so if you're getting insurance from your job and you're with a large employer, remember to, to keep that distinction in mind and, um, and what that means, or whether you're looking to HR for information about your plan versus from the insurance company itself. Um, also remember some of those issues that Katie talked about, about whether you'll be able to use manufacturer copay cards and whether those will count towards your deductible. Now I want to talk about one um, twist here in sort of the middle of the slide, which is um, if your employer offers insurance and it meets general federal standards for affordability and coverage, and those standards apply to a, a general population, it doesn't, it, those standards don't mean that your the coverage necessarily meets the specific needs of our community even so if it meets the general standards and it's available to you you will not be entitled to subsidies to buy insurance on the marketplace so this is a little bit of a quirk or a trap for the unwary um, and just something to bear in mind. Um, in California, the GHPP program may be able to actually fill gaps in this circumstance, and we'll talk about that a little later. But if you have insurance available through your employer, it is most likely that you will not be entitled to reject that insurance and get premium assistance to buy on the marketplace. You can buy on the marketplace, but you won't get premium assistance. Um, so again, the, the job-based insurance is sort of the default option, but um, what happens if you're working but your employer doesn't offer insurance, or what if you're self-employed? Um, individual coverage on and off the marketplace is another option. So CoveredCalifornia.com is the California ACA marketplace, and again, you can reach it from healthcare.gov or coveredcalifornia.com. And this is where you can buy um, an ACA plan. Uh, if your income is up to 400% of the federal poverty level, that's what FPL stands for, and that means up to about $48,000 a year this year for an individual, and the amount increases if you have family that you're responsible for. If your income is up to that level, you may be entitled to tax credits to help you pay the premiums if you buy a marketplace plan. If your income is lower than that, if it's between the 100 and 250% range, so and that works out to about up to $30,000 a year for an individual, you would be you may be entitled not only to premium assistance but also to assistance with your out-of-pocket spending but this requires that you buy a silver plan on the marketplace. So um, there, there are strong reasons if you are looking at buying individual insurance and your income is at, the, at or below these levels to look on the marketplace. Um, and especially if you're at, at this level up to 250%, up to $30,000 a year, because you get assistance not only with the premiums, but also with the co-pays and deductibles and co-insurance that you might have to pay out of pocket. If you are um, off to a roaring start in your career and your income is higher than $48,000 a year, then you might want to look at your off-marketplace options as well, because you're not entitled to 
um, assistance with your premiums or with your co-pays. And this year, because of all the uncertainty created by events in Washington and the debate over ACA um, repeal and replace and certain administration actions, um, marketplace plans have gotten very expensive. And in some states, for people who don't get assistance with premiums or copays, they will find better deals off the marketplace. And to find those, um, some states you can look online and in others, your best bet is to work with an insurance broker. So public health plans are another option for people who don't have access to insurance through their job. Um, and Medi-Cal is California's Medicaid program. Um, it provides free or low cost health coverage to eligible individuals and families based on income. And that includes adults. Some states around the country don't, don't include uh, childless adults in their Medicaid program, but Medi-Cal does. Um, they offer numerous ways to uh, apply for coverage, so by mail, in person. Yeah, you can get there through Cal CoveredCalifornia.com, and as Katie said, you can uh, enroll at any time. They try to make the coverage um, comparable in some respects to private coverage, so they offer coverage via 22 different health plans, and some of these are actually the same as the plans that are offered on the Covered California Marketplace. The choices are going to depend where you live, and you can find that either in printed or more likely in online materials um, made available by the state. Um, the uh, eligibility, the income levels are basically under 138% of that federal poverty level, which works out to just under 16,400 for an individual. And again, that, that varies if you are getting family coverage, it goes higher. And as Katie mentions, you, it mentioned, you can also qualify not only by virtue of income, but if you're disabled or enrolled in certain other public programs like aid to families with dependent children. Um, the Medi-Cal plans, again, they're, they are trying to look like the private plans available on the marketplace. They do cover essential health benefits, including doctors, hospitalization, and prescription drugs. And for, for many or most individuals, coverage is no, no cost, so no premiums, no out-of-pocket. But depending on income, so this is more if you're getting coverage um, to cover dependent children. If your income is high enough, you may be charged um, some premiums to cover those children. Um, and with Medi-Cal, as with private plans, uh, it's important to know who is in network and you can get information about in-network doctors and covered medications online or from the particular health plan's customer service line. Um, your HTC, if you see one, may be a resource on what is a good plan to pick uh, if you have a range of options available to you under Medi-Cal. The GHPP is um, another category of public health plan that's specific to California. That's short for the Genetically Handicapped Persons Program. Um, it covers adult residents of California who are diagnosed with specific genetic conditions, and this includes the various hemophilias and von Willebrand's disease. Um, if you are a young person, you may have been covered by a separate program, CCS, um, but that ends at 21. So if you are in this transitional age frame and you're turning 26 now, you may have already been on GHPP for up to five years. Um, it is available regardless of income level. So uh, you, it, if your income is high enough, you may have to pay an annual enrollment fee, and that will hinge on your income and your family size, and enrollment and then re-enrollment is annually on the anniversary of your enrollment. Um, but because you can, it, it, you're not barred by virtue of too high an income, uh, 
individuals who have private insurance can apply for GHPP benefits. And that scenario that we talked about um, where you might have insurance through your employer that, that, me, that prevents you from getting subsidies on the marketplace, but it doesn't cover your needs as a person with a bleeding disorder, this is where GHPP might really be able to fill that gap. Um, GHPP will not pay your insurance premiums, but, and it will, but in this situation, it will be a secondary payer. Um, similarly, people with Medi-Cal can also apply for GHPP benefits, and in that case, GHPP becomes a case manager for the services, for the coverage you get under Medi-Cal. Uh, so GHPP can help pay for doctor visits, hospital stays, medication, physical therapy. It's typically for items or services connected to your bleeding disorder, not for um, unrelated uh, services. So two final options for young people who are aging off their in parents' insurance, and I'm going to deal with them very briefly because I think they're probably of less importance for California given the robust Medi-Cal and GHPP programs. Um, but in case you have relatives in other states or, uh, and in the interest of completeness and because it's in our infographic, it's, it's worth mentioning them just briefly. So the first is COBRA, which is an incredibly um, uninformative name, and the long name isn't any better, the Consolidated Omnibus Budget Reconciliation Act of 1986. COBRA has been around for a while, almost, well, I guess 40 years now. Uh, am I doing the math? 30. <laughs> Sorry. Um, COBRA was much more important before the ACA was passed. Um, it basically said if you have insurance through your job and you lose that coverage for a range of reasons, including losing your job as long as it wasn't for gross conduct um, or a divorce or the death of the policyholder, you can temporarily continue that job, that coverage from your employer's insurance. And aging out of dependent coverage is one of those events that allows you to trigger COBRA. So under COBRA, you can continue coverage under the parent's job-based health plan for up to 36 months. But it's important to know that COBRA coverage is expensive because to, to exercise your rights under COBRA, you have to pay 100% of the premium. So that means the share that the employer was paying as well as the share that you were getting deducted from your paycheck or your parent was getting deducted from your paycheck, plus a small administrative fee. So it is an expensive option. Um, you probably in California have better options, but it is sort of a safety net that's out there. Um, and to exercise the COBRA option, uh, the parent, whoever the employed person is, should check with HR for requirements on how to trigger it and when, what the timeline is. And then uh, finally, I just want to talk about student health plans with a college or university. In the past, these were not a good option because they, they typically, student health plans typically offered pretty bad coverage. But most student health plans now have to meet ACA coverage standards. Um, state university plans in particular in many states are linked to or comparable with the state employee health plans. Um, so they do provide essential health benefits and, and the full range of ACA uh, mandated uh, protections. So uh, check eligibility requirements. Uh, do you have to be a full-time student, a three-quarters time student? Um, uh, but this is one other option out there. And with that, I am going to turn things back to Katie. All right. I will add one last thing about the student health plan. Um, we have been hearing and seeing a trend more and more that most, many universities are um, transferring people over to the marketplace. So you might be, if you go to check to see that there's looking for a health plan and there's not one, it's because they might want you to go onto the marketplace and you might have something to work out there. So just something to think about. But I'm just going to briefly go over, um, we talked a lot about all of this, so I'm going to kind of go through these slides a little bit more quickly. but always good to reiterate just things to consider when you're out there buying a plan um, you you know this is the first time that you have to look in doing this what do you have to think about so what uh, are your 
past benefits. So if you're turning um, turning 26 and this is your first time, talk to your parents about how much uh, of you how much you cost or how much you used in the past year or so. And then you know what are you anticipating for the following year? How are you going to you know probably going to have to have at least one visit with your specialist? Um, are you are going to need any surgery? Are you having any issues with the target joint? Or you know think about those things. Um, are you going to need dental care? Are you going to need optical care? So just try to think about the anything that might happen in the next year. And then um, if you're going to be looking at the individual marketplace, try, to, you know, are you entitled to tax credits? Are you entitled to help with out-of-pocket spending um, and making sure you're just thinking about those costs? So determine, you know, the monthly premiums. As I talked to you before, sometimes you can run across, across a high deductible health plan and it seems, you know, but you're just looking at the premiums and you say, gosh, this is only $200 a month. That's not always the best option. So what are the premiums, but also what's the deductible? You know, remember that as a person with a bleeding disorder, you will be using, um, you know, if you are using treatment frequently or if you have to go to your HTC at least once a year, you're going to be using that money. So you will be owed what the deductible is. So it's not always the best option to get um, a low, low premium plan that has a high deductible. But if you get a high deductible plan, you know, can you use a health savings account? Is there an HSA option? And then thinking about procedures or surgeries coming up. Um, but like I said before, don't automatically assume that the plan with the lowest premiums makes the most financial sense for you. You know, we talked about this a lot, but just to reiterate, um, on the next plan that you choose, verify that your uh, physical therapist, your HTC, your hematologist, um, any hospital that are in network, uh, any provider that you want to use or you plan on using. We have seen uh, with some of these narrowing networks that maybe the hospital system is in network and maybe your hematologist is, but your physical therapist is not. So make sure that you call the plan, they will know who's in network. You can often always talk, call, if you go to an HTC, call that social worker. They'll generally know who's, if they're in network for something or not, but just it's really important to verify that. You don't want to go to a visit and then get hit with a big bill after that that you didn't plan for, um, especially in these early days of, days of transitioning, you know, every, when you're trying to budget and you just make sure you know um, what expenses you're going to have to take care of. Another important thing to consider is uh, whether your pharmacy or specialty pharmacy is a network. Have you been using the same specialty pharmacy for a really long time and you want to keep them? A lot of uh, plans, especially on the marketplace, have narrow networks and don't. A lot of them mandate the use of a, one particular pharmacy. So you might get a plan and it might seem fine, but then all of a sudden they're going to mandate you to use, you know, a big CVS and you don't want to use that and, and you don't, you're not familiar with them. So make sure that if you if you want to use your local 340b or if you want to do um anything another pharmacy that 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 is in network also make sure that your medication is in network we are seeing plans create what are the, these lists that are called formularies and what they do is is that they take some products and they put them on this on this list and some of them cost this much and some of them cost a little bit more and then some of them aren't on the list at all. And so if you wanna to get to a product that's not on the list, um, you might have to pay extra or you might have to jump through some hoops. And so see if your plan, um, make sure your medication is on that formulary, make sure that uh, you have access to it. Um, we've seen one plan in particular make patients fail on a number of products before they can get to the product that they want. So. Just make sure that you uh, that if the if your plan has developed a formulary that your product is on there and it's at at a tier or at a level that you can afford. Um, and then if you're on Medicaid, just make sure that if you know um, that it's covered as well as a preferred drug there. So just know the rules of your plan. Um, do you need prior approval to see a specialist? So if you're doing a plan for the for the first time and um, that means that you might have to go see a primary care provider and get a referral to the HTC that you've been going to for, you know, your whole life because this is a new plan. And, and so just make sure that you know the rules of the plan. You don't just say, oh, I got this plan and then just pop into your, pop into your HTC. Those are specialists. So you might have to go to a doctor's visit within that plan first. You know, tell them that you have a bleeding disorder. Explain to them that you need that referral, and just make sure that um, 
whatever the rules are of your plan, you're following them, because if you don't, they will charge you extra. Um, do you need prior authorization for your treatments? Uh, does the plan say that, okay, they cover stuff, but make sure that you ask, okay, it's covered, but, but what's your prior authorization procedure when you're calling an app? And that means, um, you know, how often am I or my doctor going to have to call and get free approval for me to use my medicine? We're seeing more and more plans put in these kind of burdens and prior authorization procedures. Um, are there limits to the number of times you can receive certain services? So um, some of these plans have limits on specialty visits. So they have limits on, uh, this happens a lot, limits particularly on physical therapist visits. We're seeing a lot of that limitation that they, you know, you can see a physical therapist, but they'll only pay for the first eight times. And if you know if you're having some joint issue and you need to see a physical therapist throughout that year, um, just make sure you know know what the rules are and then how much will you have to pay if you absolutely have to go out of network. So those are the things to consider. Um, just make sure you read your plan, make sure you know your rules, make sure you know who and what you need is covered. That is just cannot stress that enough for every person with a bleeding disorder. So for helpful resources, um, if you got transition, gottransition.org, um, younginvincibles.org is an organization we work really closely with. They're fantastic. They were responsible really wholly for getting the, um, the coverage until you're age 26 into the Affordable Care Act, and they've got something called a Healthy Adulting Toolkit, and that's great. Um, the American Society of Hematology has a hemophilia transition readiness assessment. Um, that's, that's always great. And then HFA, we've got a lot of resources, um, our healthcare coverage pages, and then you can find that turning 26 infographic on, to, um, on our page right there. So, and always, as always, if you have any questions or concerns, advocacy at hemophiliafed.org. You can always shoot that email address and somebody from our policy and advocacy team will get back to you. And we help individuals all the time. So, please feel free to reach out. All right, any questions? I think we have got a few minutes left for questions. And I will unmute everyone right now, so people who are just calling in, you'll be able to ask questions. Hi, I have a quick question. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Um, I was just curious on the self-insured uh, say you work for a big company, they have 10,000 people, everybody's paying in their premiums. What happens if their liability exceeds what they collect? Well, that is an interesting question, and I don't know that we've ever been asked that before. Um, <laughs> I would imagine there. that's their problem. Yeah, I, I have a feeling that most large self-insured plans reinsure for that outside yeah, risk. And oh, so, they, yeah. so they, on the back end, sort of invisible mm -hmm. to their employees, have mm -hmm. insurance against their outside exposure. Mm -hmm. But okay, also, uh, many, of, yeah, many of these large companies um, have people that work within them that are solely responsible for designing their medical benefits. So, or they contract with a company that designs medical benefits. So they they operate much like insurance companies that they know who their employees are, how many, and they plan really thoughtfully for this. It's not just that they think, oh, you know, we'll set aside a million dollars today. Um, you know, there is that federal reinsurance option, but then they also have people that work for them that will operate much like insurers that kind of design their benefit for them. Great, thanks. Any other questions? If you think, think of something later, as I said, always please feel free to email us at advocacy at hemophiliafed.org. I know it always happens to me that I think I have a great question, but I remember it two hours after the time. And I'll take a moment here to just remind people that um, all of the recording of this webinar 
and the slides will be available at hemophiliaca.org. Um, and the recording will be available in uh, probably about two weeks. We'll also email participants with um, a link to that page as well once we have the materials up there. All right, that seems to be the end of our questions. So thank you very much, Katie and Miriam, for putting together all of this information. That was a very comprehensive overview. Absolutely, thanks for having us. Yes, thank you. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye.